many people are talking about the realm of testosterone, but I think we don't, you know, a lot of people still don't really understand like what is it as a hormone? What exactly is it? Where is it produced? How do I produce it more endogenously? That means within the body rather than taking it exogenously with, you know, outside of the body. And how can I optimize it? So why don't we why don't we start there? And um, for the purpose of the episode, guys, we're gonna uh, we'll start by just talking about like natural ways of of producing testosterone. Okay. So the first thing is, both men and women have testosterone. Important to know that. Imagine that on your cell you have hundreds of different receptors for testosterone, meaning there are so many different functions it serves in your body. For men, yes, does it produce more hair? Yes, does it give you more masculine characteristics? But the other really important things are, it helps you think better. It gives you, and Dr. Huberman talks about this all the time, it gives you this motivation to want to do hard work, which is really interesting. It gives you the ability to produce stronger bones. It decreases dementia over the longer course of time. It actually makes sure it regulates your hormone cycles so you don't become insulin resistant. Like There are a lot of different things that it does in your body. So where is it produced? Let me take another step back and kind of talk about, and I don't know if you can put a little chart up on here, but so imagine we've got a little temperature. Uh, let me take another step back. This thing here is called your hypothalamus and your pituitary. It's like a little kind of temperature regulator that sits in the base of your brain. Now imagine that temperature regulator, it senses what's going on in your body and based upon what's going on in your body, it sends a signal down to your testes. And for male, that signal is modulated by something called LH, luteinizing hormone. So luteinizing hormone travels down to your testes, it finds these cells, it gives them a high five and this says, hey guys, produce testosterone. So then your testes produce testosterone for your body to consume. Now there's some portion of that testosterone that gets bound up by other hormones. They basically grab onto it and they say, hey look, we're gonna spend time with you, we're not gonna let the rest of your, our body use you. So the bioavailability of the testosterone actually decreases a little bit. And so there's another number you have that's important. It's called your free testosterone level. And that is what is allowed to do useful things in your body. Some of that testosterone converts into estrogen. So then you have two different hormones traveling in your body. You've got estrogen and you've got this free testosterone that hits your temperature regulator here in the top of your brain and basically tell it to either increase or decrease your total testosterone. Now, I'm gonna, go ahead. It's interesting that you, you know, I often refer um, to the hypothalamus as Grand Central Station. Grand it's, Central Station. It is because, you know, you go to Grand Central, it's this hub, but you can go a million different ways. And that's what the hypothalamus does. So it's like a Grand Central Station. One thing that I just want to ask is you, you, you keep saying temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what does that, are we talking about if you get really hot, if you get really cold, it produces various amounts of testosterone? I am so happy. And maybe temperature is the wrong word to use. And I love the way that you use Grand Central Station because it really is kind of like a bunch of things are happening in your body and this is sensing what's happening in your body. And based upon that, it's telling what trains to leave on time. Yeah. Right, so it really isn't if you feel hot, your hypothalamus and your pituitary is saying produce more testosterone. It's really saying how much of that other hormone is in your body and based upon that, let me tell what other trains to run. Okay, right. So the beginning of then this low testosterone begins in the hypothalamus? Well, that's a little bit more. There's what they call primary hypogonadism. Yeah. And there's called secondary hypogonadism. And hypo is low. That is correct. Yeah. And gonadism means uh, low testosterone for all intents and purposes. Okay. Now, one form of te low testosterone is because the signal or the train running from Grand Central in your brain down to your testes is not running. And the other one is, hey, your testes are actually broken a little bit. And no matter how much of that train or that signal runs, they're just not gonna produce a whole lot more testosterone. Right, okay. That's very interesting. So then is, then the, is it because I'm still trying to understand what blocks, like what tells the train not to go? Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about young men very yeah. specifically, right? So all of these endocrine disrupting chemicals. Actually, that was, yeah, that's, that was going to be my, my next question. 
Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to ask it then if we're going to get into Go this because it. it's interesting. Because when researching the episode, I read also that environmental contaminants play a role in the decline in, in testosterone. Glyphosate, which is the primary chemical compound found in Roundup, which is the most widely used herbicide in the United States, has been shown to reduce testosterone levels, alter testicular structure, kill testosterone-producing mm. Leydig cells, and interfere with pubertal development. Then you've got astrazine, the second most widely used herbicide in the United States, also significantly lowers testosterone, but even more alarming has been shown to cause testicular deformi de deformities and hermaphroditism mm. in amphibians. That was a direct quote. Again, that wasn't from me. However, we have a real problem on our hand if we're now dealing with glyphosate, which is lowering testosterone. I mean, I'm going to have a sip of my water really quickly here. Yeah. And I almost say that jokingly because there's a high probability that this water has some of that in it. Don't tell me that. I'm, I, this is I terrifying. I need Evie on to sponsor me now. <laughs> <laughs> For glass water bottles. That's it. I'll tell you, it's, it really is scary when you think about the very simple fact that everything we're doing is probably, at least for a man, poisoning our body to a certain extent.